Damn, man. Gliding through, man, with a little bit of style on that hit show. A story's written by a current prisoner, man. It's your favorite journalist, Tony. You know, doing this thing, man. First and foremost, before we even dive into this thing, man, I want to apologize and delay of videos lately. I have been dealing with some personal issues. However, everything is good to go now. So we're going to go ahead and kick this thing off full throttle. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, man, the times have changed. The times have changed. You know, from now on, on stories written by a current prisoner, our primary focus is to bring you these live exclusive video chats, video phone calls, FaceTimes, however you want to call it. We are now transitioning from audio, actual phone calls that you're used to listening to, to video chats. You're actually going to be able to see the inmate face to face, his emotions, his expressions. This is the new thing. This is the new hit show of stories written by a current prisoner. So if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, man, we're going to be dropping some bangers. Hit that subscribe button, man. But for all you people out there that's been riding with me, man, thank you, man. Thank you for showing some support, man. And please hit that like button on your way out. You know what I'm saying? With that being said, I'm sure you guys have already seen the poster. Me, myself, and Mr. Gunner. Yes, we are getting in that squared circle. The boxing event. The YouTube extravaganza, the YouTube rumble, the YouTube wars, wherever you want to call it, man. It really is going down. Las Vegas, Nevada, August 13th. There is no ranking out. There is no, Contracts are already signed. Everything is already in motion. Location has been chosen. The venue is already... Everything is good to go, man. Me and Mr. Gunner, we're fighting, man. So be on the lookout for that. With that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this interview real quick, into this uh, live video chat. Before you guys uh, scorch me in the comment section... We, we are uh, we did upgrade on the microphone however with this new video chat system the whole dynamics have entirely changed so we are gonna um, try to enhance the video quality and the audio quality however give me some time with that being said let's dive into this thing man thank you for showing your support and thank you for tuning in my name is Edmundo Toledo this is my story I'm here to here to share our story because my story is not just my story it's also my victim story as well it's our story Efren Hernandez Vargas and Azahel Cruz. Efren was 18. Azahel was a six-year-old boy. It's our story, and every time I, sh I share my story, there's spirits with me. And I really hope that um, you can take, take what I got to say and apply it into your life. You think the life you want to go, man. God bless. Hope you enjoy. So what did they call you? They used to call me Eddie Boy. What are you incarcerated? Like growing up at Go ahead. No, uh, they, they used to call me Eddie Boy. I'm no longer go by Eddie Boy. I go by Eddie Mundo. You know, that's my, kind of my government name with a little twist to it. <laughs> that's right. That's right, man. What are you incarcerated for? How long is your sentence? I've been incarcerated um, for about for about 12 years. I'm incarcerated for murder. Murder in the first degree. Murder in the uh, another murder in the first degree. And I took signed my life to uh, thirty five to life as a deal, and I got both my murders dropped down to uh, two second degrees. So I'm currently incarcerated for second degree murders on a thirty five to life sentence. Where are you from? Right here on the streets. I'm from Salinas, California. Do you or did you belong to any type of gangs, groups, organizations? Um, yeah, I used to be a, a, a Norteño from uh, from Salinas Acasa Plaza. So talk to me, man. Um, what was your childhood like, man? You know, uh, do you come from a normal background? Did you have both your uh, parents in your life? You know, did you go through any type of traumatic experience as a young child? Well, um, you're asking, uh, did I come from a healthy, uh, healthy family setting? Well, um, growing up, I was around gangs and drugs, and I mean, my mother and part, father argued a lot constantly. And uh, being an overweight child with a learning disability, I was always uh, giving a negative, giving a negative, um, giving a negative uh, insults to me. Those are the things uh, that I was been that I've been through, and. Um, Basically, that led to, to me normalizing gang lifestyle, having low self-esteem. And in a nutshell, my boy, it's uh, all my physical needs were met. But the thing that, uh, that I didn't really have was uh, having emotionally uh, connected parents. Like, um, I was exposed to a lot of uh, domestic violence. My parents would always argue. So they were really into their own lives. 
So in a nutshell, did I come from a, a healthy family setting? I mean, I love my my parents to death, but um, I was exposed to a lot of tox uh, toxicity around me. So um, a lot of people, bro, uh, a lot of people go through, have their own problems, man. A lot of people have been through so many different things. You know, did you did you go through any type of things, man, as a young child, man, that you still remember to this very day that somewhat has affected you or changed you mentally? Well, there's things that, that, that I went through that I had to deal with um, certain traumas that I didn't know how to deal with growing up. Like uh, growing up, I was uh, physically abused, mentally abused, and even sexually abused as a kid. Um, physically abused, I was, sometimes, uh, you know, my dad, he had really, uh, he had really low patience with me because I had a, I had a learning disability and that learning disability, uh, and he, he had very low patience, man. And he would hit me, pull my hair, you know, old traditional, old school Mexican, uh, Mexican uh, tradition. He taught me that uh, boys don't cry, and if I cry, he's gonna hit me. You know things like that. But uh, I love my pops to death, and he raised me the best he could. And uh, you know, mentally, you know, emotionally, I was always put down as a kid because you know I had a learning disability, and I also I was an overweight kid, so I was always met with insults such as like being called a fat ass, being called a, a dumb ass, and all these things were, were just little seeds in my head that just sprouted into. Uh, Spouting into trees of doubt, man. I mean, it was really hard for me as a kid. Also, uh, I, was, I was sexually abused by a relative. And that right there was a really significant um, form of trauma that I experienced because that embedded in me self-doubt. And it made me think uh, um, less myself, made me feel powerless. It made me feel like I wasn't a man. And... Um, I never really told anybody about this. And I just barely started coming into my healing just recently. So I remember uh, as a kid, I would just sit in, in my bed. I sat in my bed for like three days, just in my thoughts about what had, just, what had happened. Uh, Cause this was a, a year later, I had learned how to scorch my emotions. I learned how to scorch my emotions because I had told my father, but he didn't believe me. So as a year as a year passed by, I'm thinking about everything. I've been sitting with this with this trauma for about a year already, and I started the, the thought came to my mind that I should just take my own life. And I'm here. I am. I'm only ten years old. Just thinking this. I remember, my mom comes in. She asked me, "Son, what's wrong?" And I just broke down and I told her, "I don't want to live no more." I remember uh, holding on to her, holding on to her shirt and just crying and crying and crying. Telling her I didn't want to leave no more. And she was asking why, why? I just couldn't tell her. So I mean, we're uh, my family's old school Mexican, so we don't they don't really look into uh, trauma therapy or, or or mental health. So I was taken to the doctor, they went to the doctor and they just prescribed me more medication. Mind you, I was on, I was already on Adderall because I had a, a learning disability with my AED. So I learned how to squelch my emotions even more. And that was a trauma that, uh, that was really heavy in my life. Also, uh, my parents had divorced. So when my parents divorced, my father went into his own life. And as he went into his own life, I started to lose value in myself and more, even more because he was my only um, he was my only role model in my life that I, that I that I looked up to. He was my father. But as he went into his own life, I started to lose empathy for people. Started to become callous. I started to think like, man, if he doesn't care about me, why should I give a fuck about anybody? It was a trauma. That was, that was a significant trauma in my life. Man, I'm very sorry that, that you had to really experience all that, man. That was very unfortunate, man. I'm very sorry to hear that. 
Those don't feel sorry, man. You know, I'm okay now. I'm still, I'm in healing. I'm becoming a better person. And I... so sometimes there are several determining factors why one chooses uh, to go down this path, man, of, of, of wanting to become a gangster. You know, whether it's a family influence, whether it's just simply growing up in, in, in a neighborhood that just has that stronghold. You know, man, can you tell me, man, what was your experience like, man? Well, um, the thing why I, I became a gang member was uh, I had a really, uh, I had a, a bad tendency for, how do you say, I had a unhealthy, really bad, unhealthy desire to seek uh, love and attention. So, as I explained earlier about my, what my traumas were, I mean, that went into my teen years. So, you know, I remember, yeah, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah, so as my teen years came in, uh, I remember uh, when I finally took that initiative to become a gang member, I walked, you know, they gave me a gun. And when I, I had that gun in my hand, it was a, it was a 357 uh, Smith & Wesson, a black, uh, a black one with a wooden handle. And when they gave me that gun, man, the, I, all my insecurities, everything, all the powerlessness that I felt as a kid, it went away. And when I, uh, when they gave it to me, I went to go use that gun. And when I used that gun, I came back to the neighborhood. Like they were talking about, hey, did you hear that? And then I remember my buddy, well, my buddy, the homie, thank you, the homie, he was telling me, Hey, did you hear? Did you hear the uh, those shots? And everybody in the neighborhood was like, "Oh yeah, that was a uh, that was their their shooting out there." And my boy's like, "That was that was the army right here." And right away, bro, I was met with applause. I was met with with pat on the back. I was met with so much love, bro, because of this this uh, negative thing that I did. And when I did that, man, I, I felt my heart was racing. I felt that acceptance that I didn't get because at home, my mother was never home. My father um, was in his own life and I was really emotionally distant from my uh, from my stepdad. So the gang, what drove me to the gang was the, the desire, the unhealthy acceptance and desire to be loved. Can you tell me, man, what what it was like for you, man, growing up in Salinas, man? Salinas, obviously, man, has always had this reputation of being heavily infested with gangs, you know, of it being a, of it being a very dangerous place. You know, it actually made murder capital one time. You know, what was that like for you, man? And uh, did you lose any friends do, in, in those years? Man, uh, I remember... Uh... Around that time, uh, that was around the time when I was uh, being initiated into my gang. You know, those were really hard times because I lost a lot of friends. I lost, uh, I lost family members to the system. When I was 15, my cousin, uh, I'm gonna keep his name anonymous. He was actually charged with murder at the age of 17. Man, that was really devastating. So it left me with a us against them mentality towards the law enforcement. So that 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 heightened my my other family members, my cousins, that heightened us to a, a, an even deep, a, even deeper criminal mentality. And then um, in '09, the year that we uh, that Salinas, I wouldn't say we, but Salinas uh, reached murder capital, and I lost my two other cousins to the system as well for murder. They both uh, they committed murder and. Uh, so you get the gist of, of the lifestyle of living just by, you know, my family being lost to the system. I also lost a, my, a lot of friends in that too, I mean, going to funerals. Like just, um, it festered more of the, uh, of, the, of the hate, more of the criminal mentality. It just, it built and built and built just by seeing all this negative stuff. So me growing up, man, uh, into that lifestyle, it was, uh, it was very traumatic dealing with that. Is, is there anything one else? Thing, Go ahead. One thing that was a big contributing factor to uh, to why I murdered Ephraim was uh, back in, in 2010, I was a victim of, of a shooting where my, uh, where me and my cousins, we went to a party and when we went to this party, my cousin Salvador Vargas, Salvatore Vargas, 
he was shot and I was shot right next to him as well. You know how it is when people drink at parties and, you know, get their gang members around, you know, your people are on alcohol, you know, guns come out, fights, fights happen, guns come out. And I remember that day, man, uh, I heard you know, when the, when the shots started firing, I thought somebody was shooting in the air. I see everybody running. And when I looked, when I looked in front of me, cause I looked back, I looked in front of me. I noticed I was uh, standing in front of someone with a pistol. And that's when everything started to go really slow, man. And all I seen was this, this loud, this, uh, I seen this big flash and then a loud bang. And then I remember looking down at my shirt and it flew out like this down to my left rib cage. And I seen blood squirt out. And when that happened, I, reality came back. I just realized like, I, I just been shot. So I turned around and I'm running. You know, I'm yelling at my cousins like, damn bro, hey, I just got shot. And my little cousin, uh, Dominic, points at his arm too. He's like, I got shot too. And then, um, okay, next, man. So I see my cousin on the floor, my cousin's cell. He's holding onto his chest. And I'll never forget, man, the look on his face. Uh, his eyes rolled back in the back of his head, his mouth open. And I knew that's when his soul was leaving his body. And everything happened so fast. I didn't even realize it was happening. Like, like I was in shock. What just happened? Moments later, you know, Dominic goes up to a cell, holds him in his arms. I'm bleeding on the floor. He ends up dying in his arms. Not right there. I didn't even realize that I had suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I thought in my head, if someone could easily shoot me, I could be just as cold. I mean, I had already done shootings, but I had never killed anybody. So being a victim of that shooting, I internalized that as I'm going to kill somebody. No. They, just, they just shot me. They killed my cousin right in front of me. I'm taking that as the ultimate disrespect. I'm going to kill somebody now. May I ask, um, the, the people that, that, that killed your cousin and shot you, um, were there, at, were there also fellow Northerners or were there Southerners? Well, in this case, we were all at a party, right? And, uh, they were all also Northerners as well. So it was a, a red on red crime. So it was a no, no, but it happened anyways. And, and so, so can you go ahead and, and proceed from there, man? So, what proceeded to happen after that, man? How, how did you catch this case? Well, I mean, the next day after my cousin was killed, I remember seeing, uh, I remember seeing my auntie. She was laying on his bed because I went over to their house. Everybody was there. And when I, I remember seeing him on his bed. She was crying. My little, uh, my little cousin Dominic was crying, and it was a big thing, man. But moments after, my aunt, aunt got up and she grabbed me and she asked me what happened. And she was just really frantic. She did. She was asking me a lot of questions. I just didn't even know how to answer. I just felt her tears beating up on my neck. When I felt that man, I just felt a cold chill on my neck and I just knew I had to kill somebody. I'm gonna call you back. As this uh, insecure person, gang member, I carried a lot of traumas and with this new form of trauma, it was just adding fuel to the fire that I already had within myself that I had not yet dealt with. So, 
I went on a, a kind of like on a, a drug induced coma for about two weeks. I was prescribed the uh, narcos because of uh, I had got shot. And I remember just closing my eyes. Every time I close my eyes, I just see see that image of my cousin out. That ugly image, I'll never forget, man. The way his eyes rolled in the back of the head and his mouth open. His body just stiffened up. And I just felt more and more rage every time I thought about it, man. Every time I closed my eyes and was drug induced and drug induced a, a coma. So I fell right back into my addiction, drinking. And I picked up other things. I started doing cocaine, which gave me which got me angry. And I'll smoke smoke weed to just put myself to sleep. So here I am doing all this drugs, plotting on ways on how to uh, on how to take another person on how to take a person's life because of what had just happened. I can't really move that well because my ribs are broken. Because the bullet had a uh, uh, struck uh, my left rib and it came out the back of uh, on my, out of my back. So it took me like about three months to heal. So as I'm healing, right? My gang's telling me that I gotta do something. I'm already knowing I gotta do something, but it's already been three months. And I don't wanna uh, lose the acceptance that I felt like I needed uh, to hold on to. So I asked for assistance from a friend of mine. Well, he, was, he, was a, he was a gang member too. He was from a, a WSL, West Side Locals in Salinas. He was also fell Northern. He said he had my back. So, on the night that I murdered Efren, we drove over to Castroville. So that's where the murder happened, where my uh, my cousin was killed in the city of in the town of Castroville. And um, when that happened, you know, we drove over there. I got out of the car. And this was something that always, you know, that I carried to it as well. Uh, I remember walking up to Ephraim and, and no one deserves to die like that. But the one thing I do remember was that the way he died, the way I murdered him, the same facial expression was the same way Sal had on his, on his face. So, we ended up getting on a high-speed chase. We got away, and I end up coming. To, uh, I end up coming. Uh, I end up going on the run because I left my cell phone inside the car. Excuse me. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well. I'm on the run now because I left my cell phone in the in the car. When we went on a high-speed chase, I had left my cell phone inside the car. And when I left the cell phone in the car, um, they knew it was mine. But the car was under my uh, my co-defendant's name. So they ended up tracing it back to him. And I mean, he said what he said. He did what he did. I don't blame him. It's okay. But I'm on the run. And when I get... Uh, when I get arrested, I'm arrested in San Diego. I get locked up. The U.S. Marshals come and take me back to Monterey County. When I go back to Monterey County, I'm charged charged with murder in the first degree. And that's how uh, that's how the case happened with Efren. Now, now, as soon as you get arrested, man, you know you go through the processing. You know the fingerprints you. Um, you know, they, they, they book you, man. What is the rush of emotions that came over you, man? You know, what were you thinking, you know, that whole night before you went to sleep? Could you sleep that night? You woke up the next morning, you know, to, to your new reality. You might be facing life. You know, what was all that like for you, man, from what you remember? From what I remember, I just experienced a lot of fear. I was very afraid. And I experienced a lot of hate within me. I hated... I hated life. I hated God. I thought like, you take my, you take my cousin. I can't even go do something right that I felt that I thought was right because that's how what my uh, belief system was that it was uh, I thought I was doing the right thing. But I felt fear 
I didn't know what to do because it was also a red on red crime. So I know when I come to, when I come to county jail, I'm gonna probably be dealt with. So I immediately um, go to the S and Y side. Absolutely, man. Um. Um, let me let me add on the, uh, when I was on the S and Y side, right? Uh, my cousin um, who had a member prior. Uh, how I told you how I got had a lost a cousin. Um, in 09 because i had two in 09 who got busted for uh, for a murder yeah one of them was right there on the sny side so when i was with him you know me and him talked you know and uh we became sally's you know it felt like you know like kind of like a reunite but at the same time uh he held a lot of resentment towards me because uh I was still active on the streets, but he was asking why, and I kind of, I left him in a, uh, he felt neglected, and I don't blame him for how he felt towards me, but uh, as the time went by, we were sellies, things in my case with Efren, um, with the murder of Efren, was starting to look, and it was looking really good, uh, my star witness, the one who gave me a ride from the west side, he, uh, he went out on witness protection, but he ends up getting busted for uh, for three attempted murders, five robberies, and basically he got caught red-handed and he's going to prison over in Las Vegas, in uh, Nevada. And my case is looking really good now. I ain't got no star witness. The only thing they have is my cell phone, which I mean, my my lawyer was paid, so he said that we could said that we could um we could probably beat that so i'm here i am right my lawyer's telling me that i'm gonna get my case dropped now i tell my cousin this and uh this is where uh my cold case comes from azahel which uh i feel i feel happened for a reason my cousin uh his case ain't looking too well so he wears a wire on me. And when he wears this wire on me, the Azahel Cruz case comes up. So now I'm facing two murders. And, man, I was devastated then, man, because here I am thinking that I'm going to go home. But I'm now I'm being charged with two more, with another murder as well. So I go to court. And I'm 21 years old. And they hit me with a, uh, we're gonna give you death penalty. I was hard, man, cause feeling that, uh, feeling that, it, get, it got pretty heavy on me. I actually thought I could beat him to it. I and mean, I wanted to uh, take my own life because I felt hopeless. I remember just laying back looking at the, the cracks in the ceiling and just telling myself I ain't never going home. And um, as the months pass by, a year passes by, there's no way I could beat it, man. So my lawyer was telling me the best option was to sign away uh, sign away my life for uh, 35 to life. Second degree, second degree is double up. So I, uh, I mean, the only way... Uh, the only way around the problem is through it. So I decided to sign my deal at 35 to life. And this is where I'm at today. Can you, do you mind going back, man, and uh, somewhat elaborating on that situation, man? What was it that happened? Um, you, you, but what was it that happened, man, out there in, uh, at, what was it, Pocket Park? Oh, with uh, Azahel? Yeah, um, like I said, man, I was a person who uh, who had an unhealthy need for for unhealthy desire for love and attention. So remember, I told you about how my uh, how my um, fellow gang members would uh, they embraced me, they loved me for all the things that I did. Well, uh, the person who I was with, I really thought highly of him, and I didn't want to uh, I didn't want him to look down on me. But either way, uh, me and him, we were really, we were, we were pretty close at the time. We drink every day, and 
Yeah, Dave, man, uh, 